Hello and most welcome to 1997. It's only three left to the 2000. Oh. Hooray! <laughs> the magnificent 2000 recorded episodes. And then we are definitely reckon winning on the net. No comparison. Uh, we will start in the same lead as Spirals that we did earlier with uh, Jeffrey Cannon and uh, the gesture language opposition by David McNeil and in Concord with Barbara Tversky Lisa Fieldman Barrett Bar 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 um, not to be forgotten, Benjamin K. Bergen, uh, Wittgenstein, of course, embed embodied cognition, Tony Shimiro, J.J. Uh, Gibson, and many others worth mentioning. This is from the book The Matter with Things, the second volume. Our brains are delusions and the unmaking of the world. Flow and movement. The cause of coming into being of all things is the vortex. Movement is reality itself. Henri Bergson. 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 <laughs> I do not define motion as being well known at all. Well known at to all. all. To all. To all. Maybe that is some light. Some light. The cause of coming to being of all things is the vortex, Democritus, 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 Democritus. Movement is relative strength in a person. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you about the curious and extraordinary case of Jason Paget. Jason Paget. Jason Paget. <laughs> by his own account a down-to-earth party-loving furniture salesman from Tacoma, Washington party-loving furniture salesman Tacoma, Washington Tacoma, Washington he was brutally assaulted in 2002 Outside a nightclub in the early hours of the morning. Of oh, the morning. Oh, oh, of the morning. Of the, although he was concussed, scans at the time showed no obvious brain damage. Brain damage. But somehow, something remarkable relieved, revealed, none, none of the less, a deep change in the functioning of his brain. Of his brain. brain. From having no aptitude for or interest in geometry or mathematics, he suddenly developed a talent for Abstract geometrical draughtsmanship, which at first seemed to him to represent the meaning of pi. Pi. <laughs> <laughs> Minced pi, yeah, why not? And later to relate to equations such as E equals M C square or H F equals M. C square.
he, he also developed obsessive compulsive sy symptoms, which are, of course, widespread in the population. In the population. Widespread or not. Widespread. <laughs> in the population. Narrow, narrow preoccupation with stereotyped and restricted interests. Restricted interests. Only one thing, interest. Inflexibility of routine and a persistent preoccupation with parts of objects. With parts of objects. All of which are also Typical of autism. 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 Taken together, all of these features characterize, as we know, the phenomenological world of the left hemisphere. Left. Left. <laughs> Which prefers narrow focus is relatively sticky or inflexible. Prefers rule following and is engaged by parts or fragments. Atoms, fragments, reductionism, analytical philosophy, and so on and so on. And indeed, the brain damage he was later discovered to have sustained, although bilateral, was more severe in the right hemisphere. Right. He was <laughs> right. He was told that because of this, there was a possibility my left was compensating by going into overdrive. 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 <laughs> overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> In line with his reports, he was scanned while attempting to visualize mathematical formula. During these attempts to visualize mathematical expressions geometrically, brain scans showed significant activity almost exclusively, unlike normal subjects. Mm. In the left hemisphere, especially in the parietal cortex. In the parietal cortex. 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 <laughs> <laughs> We would normally expect activation principally in the right lateral cortex. Mm. But for Paget, experience of complex geometrical images emerging from mathematical formulas is restricted to the left hemisphere. Mm. According to the experimenters. And by why, by way of confirmation, disruption of the left parietal cortex interfered with his abilities to see the world in this 
way. Half of the mathematical expressions shown to Paget during the scans followed this pattern. This pattern. 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 <laughs> <laughs> the others failed to excite visual imagery altogether, one way or the other. One way or the other. The other. The other. A note at this point. Although there has been a tendency to see this as a case of sudden, almost Einstein-like seeing into the heart of mathematical problems. This seems unlikely and Jason himself does not make that claim. Good old Jason Paget. His actual math remained fairly basic after the accident. And he has, in his own words, about gone back to school to learn traditional mathematics in conventional fashion since. Oh dear. <laughs> A surprise. Although he was drawing complex geometric shapes, he didn't initially see them as representing equations. And there is no evidence that they actually do. Oh dear. No physicist or mathematician to whom I have shown the drawings can see any connection between the patterns and the mathematical formula. For instance, HF equals MC square that often form the titles. And although Paget and Seberg refer to the formula that did not induce imagery as nonsense formulas. Nonsense formulas. Nonsense formulas. <laughs> Come, Echo. Nonsense formulas. <laughs> Berit Rugord, in the, her report, in the report of her scanning study of Jason in Neurocase is careful not so to describe them because it is not true. Not true. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> There is no single mathematical difference between the two lists appended to Brugard's study of 15 formula that induced imagery in Jason and 15 that failed to do so. Fail to do so. 
Time to do something. <laughs> a physicist who saw him making the drawings urged him to get conventional mathematical training. Conventional mathematical training. Tim Chartier, a maths professor at Davidson, when asked, said that the drawings were remarkable. Indeed, remarkable in all sense. But commented that one had to be careful when using the word genius, and that Jason needed the help of a trained mathematician. Trained. 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 This does not mean them that he has found a sudden genius for maths. For maths. maths. <laughs> but rather developed an unusually perfectionist attraction to creating diagrams that are self-referring and entirely composed of straight lines. Straight lines only. Self-referring. Self-referring like Douglas Hofstadter. A loop, a circle. Straight lines, sign of the devil. Lines, sign of the devil. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that this has little to do with maths <clears throat> is not surprising since the visual spatial imagery accompanying mathematical problem solving is usually associated with the right hemisphere, not the left. Not the left. Bear in mind <clears throat> the distinction between abstract processing or manipulation of data chat GTB which is in the left hemisphere and understanding of its reference in the right. In the right. <laughs> in keeping with this, In keeping with this release phenomena in the left hemisphere often show a disinhabited production of forms. 
not necessarily accompanied by meanings. <laughs> Procedures become more important than their real world significance. No criteria, no action. This is really Wittgensteinian. Thus, in the realm of language, a phenomenon known as hypergraphia, which is compulsive writing, or hyperlalia, this is compulsive utterance, like what? Or what? Or he? Hyperlalia. So compulsive utterance. Compulsive, compulsive, compulsive. Sometimes combined under the term. Logoro, logorea, logorea, or verbal diarrhea, which is actually uh, what is constructed here. Logorea. logorea. Verbal diarrhea. <laughs> Excessive language. And may follow right hemisphere damage. Lacking the constraint of the right hemisphere, a meaningless hypertrophy of language may resort with a compulsive production of words devoid of clear reference. Clear reference. It may be that Jason's extraordinary Obsessional and painstaking drawings are a visual equivalent of this. The links he makes to significant formula are likely to be advantageous, adventitious, rather than essential. Rather than essential. Essential, essential. In any case, this looks like a release phenomenon. Release. <laughs> Secondary to right hemisphere dysfunction, in which the left hemisphere's visual system has become overactive. And almost, if one can put it that way, enriched. 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 Indeed. Enriched. <laughs> enriched. The candle. Thank you. Thank you. Before we start a fire, thank okay. you very much. After all, we have seen that an equivalent enrichment of right hemisphere function sometimes accompanies damage to the left hemisphere. So why not the reverse? Reverse. The reverse. During scans, however, Jason's right hemisphere is 
not inactive. Not inactive. <laughs> but becomes inactive when he conceives an equation as an image. The opposite of what one might expect in the normal subject. In Jason, then, here is someone whose visualizations following trauma seem to conform to the left hemisphere take on reality. 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 Come, reality, come. Come, bring us on. What would you say? Quite how true this is, though, has to be seen, as they say, to be believed. Listen to what he reports when he regained consciousness after the assault. Things looked like individual picture frames coming in and clouds moving instead of looking smooth. They looked like little tangent lines in a spiral. In a spiral. Everything was discreet and chunky. Chunky. Raindrops to me, they're these beautiful interference patterns, he said. They do not look like they're these smooth round ripples. They look like they're little tangent lines, like a tangerine. No, tangent like the spiral that Newton and Bernoulli made, if you remember. Using tangent lines. So again, the smoothness is gone from everything. Trees moving would be like an equation, translating. Like if you were to write an equation and it translates, it makes graph changes, graphs change. The next morning, while running water <laughs> in the bathroom, he noticed lines emanating out perpendicularly from the flow. <laughs> At first, I was startled and I worried for myself. But it was so beautiful that I just stood in my slippers and stared. 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 Slippers and stared. What a beautiful alliteration. <laughs> no green alliterations. <laughs> <laughs> and when he extended his hand out in front of him, it was like watching a slow motion film 
as if every slight movement was in stop motion animation. Stop motion animation. Where have we seen something very, very like this before? Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. Exciting. Indeed, all these elements so beautifully gathered together in in one example suggests the phenomenology of the left hemisphere bits and pieces of which we have seen in patients with right hemisphere damage. Oh no. Oh, damage. 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 <laughs> Holes have become parts, discrete, chunky, and chunky, chunky like me. Oh dear. Elsewhere, Jason describes everything he sees as having a pixelated look, the wholeness of things broken down into tiny discrete units. In his book, oh, he made a book, he writes, the house itself, the most familiar of lived spaces, seem to fall away as a whole and become just a collection of shapes. Of shapes. shapes. Of shapes. Flow and smoothness in time has become disrupted so that motion becomes an indefinite number of individual frames, initially tending towards stasis, fragmented and slowed down. Later on, the disjunctive nature remained, but the speed normalized. He reported everyday vision as discrete picture frames with a line connecting them, but still at real speed. Real speed. Like a cinefilm in which the frames are each distinct, not smoothed into flow. Oh. Flow. <laughs> It was it was as if someone 
is pressing the pause button on a video very quickly. Very quickly. Very quickly indeed. Very quickly. Similarly, flow and smoothness in space have become disrupted. Now, an indefinite number of little lines. Specifically, curved lines have become reduced to an indefinite number of rectilinear ones. No more spirals. <laughs> no more flow. This is a very important feature for Jason. Specifically, sorry. He reports that he experiences smooth contours as small tangent and secant line. He is obsessed with drawing complex geometrical images using only straight lines. He says, there's no such thing as a perfect circle <laughs> because he can always see the edges of a polygon. However, many side of that approximates the circle. Ah, horror. Remember Schelling's description of causative chains. The individual successions of causes and effects that deceives us with the illusion of a mechanism. Disappears being infinitely small straight lines in the universal curvature of the organism in which the world itself runs continually onward. Remember Schelling's description of causative chains. The individual successions of causes and effects that deceives us with the illusion of a mechanism disappear. Being infinitely small straight lines in the universal curvature of the organism in which the world itself runs continually onward. Oh. Onward. Oh. <laughs> Remember too, Bergson's description of the logician.
having in fact left the curve of his thought. to follow straight along a tangent. He has become exterior to himself. He returns to himself when he gets back to intuition. Back, <laughs> back to intuition. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> As mentioned, Nicholas of Cusa thought that truth is not a thing like other things or put together from other things, but indivisible, indivisible, but indivisible. The image he used to describe the problem is that the intellect moves in straight lines, whereas reality is curved. Reality is curved. It's curved. <laughs> and the curve of reality can never be reached, however many straight lines you use. Hallelujah. No matter how. I will just put a little pause and we could stop there. Yes. And let's see. It's a pause, so you're. Yeah. So, some quotes here from the text. Uh, so happy to revisit Ian McIlchrist. Uh, let's see here what we have. There's quite a lot. It's interesting that the chat, Paget, he starts to draw algorithms and diagrams and similar things without actually knowing what, the, what they are about. That is in itself really weird. He doesn't know the math behind and the math he does is just shadows of real math mathematics. He doesn't understand what he's doing. Still, he's doing it. So the left hemisphere seemed to have this obsession with dead and nonsensical things, the shadows of reality, or if you like, maybe shadows of meaning and uh, shadows of doings. He can't really do anything other than imitate. As it said in the text on page 946, his actual math skills remained fairly basic after the incident. So he didn't develop any actual skill in math, although they looked scary like the real thing. And here is a quote from Team Chartier uh, at the bottom of that paragraph, Kalle. The second one. <clears throat> well, it's actually after the site from Team Chartier. This does not mean then that he has found a sudden genius for maths, but rather developed an unusual perfectionist attraction to creating diagrams that are self-referring and entirely composed of straight lines. This is how I remember uh, when I started uh, study linguistics. It was especially Chomskyan devices and 
the professor at that time, she had this enormous whiteboard. It was much larger than normally. And she started to scribble in one hand. And six meters down, she finished like four hours later. It never ended. And they were all nonsensical. It didn't have any meaning at all. And she just wanted us to copy them. So, and that was, this is partly why I laugh when I read, because such a relief. It was enormously torturous to be there. All those years, I realized later, were uh, mis misused by me. I learned nothing or them other than despair. And we all did. 90% uh, of linguistic was like that. The only relief was down in the cellar that did phonetics. And he took in the real world, which was not liked by the neo academia. So he couldn't get a professorship or nothing. At least not in those days when professor really was professor. So the real world uh, was not liked and things that meant anything. They are allergic to, they can actually get sick if they get mean. If you're much in the left hemisphere and you start getting meaning around you, you don't understand it. And I also experienced that in philosophy, it was all diagrams, straight lines. It didn't have any sense. It was useless. And that was the point I realized. I asked my logic professor, Doug Vesterstor, can you use it? No, this is the advance of it. It doesn't get any more sad for humanity than that. <laughs> no wonder McGilkis says that we found the, the end of the world here. After this, even the apocalypse is just a positive thing. <laughs> <laughs> we need apocalypse. Apocalypse. But as he says, it has lost its danger. Nothing can get worse than this. Nothing. And I also like that the diagrams is very close to the Gödel Eschebach Gödel, uh, Kurt Gödel, doing things for his own sake. And in the third paragraph. These straight lines, and we continue, has little to do with maths. Is not surprising since that this and now the visual spectral imagery accompanying mathematical problem solving is usually associated with the right hemisphere. Right. Right. <laughs> not the left. Bear in mind between. The understanding reference in the right, where it really matters in the real world. The left hemisphere can only do computations. And we know today, within academia and also outside, everybody believes that AI is like chat GTB. It's an algorithm that collects data, information, gathers it, processes it, analyzes it, and puts it in what it thinks is syntactical order. Actually, it's just a mechanical process. The right hemisphere can do much more. It can do creative stuff. It has humor. It, all science made by the right hemisphere. All reproduction of science, what you learn in school, is done by the left hemisphere. It is just copying, parroting, real thing. And of course, the thing she scribbled on the on the board, which was actually the best I, I come upon at the university, that was just automation. I had nothing of creativity. She copied something from a book. She analyzed it. She put something out of its context. And she did it once more again. It's an algorithm playing out. And the search for original in uh, biblical scholars today, I have to say, wasn't that bad before, of course. 
is to look for an original, compute it, destroy the Bible. They are responsible for most of the atheists today because you can't feel anything anymore. Like you can't feel a poem once, once it's been cut apart. All the sense disappears. <laughs> and I know at least four or five friends who lost their faith in theology. This is where the most people lose their faith or in contact with priests. Because if you have this left hemisphere, non-humorous, taking apart, it loses God and the spirit. This seemed to have happened to Jason Paget as well. So he can only imitate. He can say the things, but he can't actually do them. It has no longer any important in real world significance. It doesn't matter for anyone anymore, not even for himself. For, the, for it to matter, he has to have access to the right hemisphere. And since the poor chap got more damaged in his left, uh, right hemisphere than in his left, that will not happen anymore. Go to page 947. Jason's extraordinary obsessional and painstaking drawings are a visual equivalent of this. It's just an empty shadowing. The links that he makes to significant formula are likely to be advantageous rather than essential. They don't have any real doings behind them. And also, the left hemisphere's visual system become overactive. If one can put it that way, enriched. And oddly enough, when he sees an hemisphere, when Jason Padgett sees, uh, 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 let's see, sorry. Uh, a diagram or an equation. He's, when he sees it as an image, really understands it, not just like formula, his right hemisphere becomes inactive. So he's actually not understanding and he's doing it over and over again. And I remember being shocked actually from Ian McIlchrist. One of Ian McIlchrist's acquaintances was called Derek Poffett. He was highly autistic. He ate the same meal every day. He never took any pauses and he never washed or anything like that. And he, he was a prominent uh, analytical philosopher, which I used to admire <laughs> to some extent. Because the professor said he's completely logical. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine the relief with Ian McIlchrist. And it's also a reference to how uh, poor Jason Paget, we can say now, sees the world. He doesn't see raindrops as raindrops. He sees them as tangents. And it's almost like I wanted to say the spiral of Newton that we saw in Jeffrey Cannon's paper in lecture 1994 or 93. It didn't look like a healthy spiral. It has tangents, just like this geometrical shapes that he had in his head when he thought of a circle. He said, a circle never becomes perfect because there is always another polygonal that you can add. That was one at 1948. It doesn't matter. 
Mm-hmm. Det kommer nästa färg. Mm. Det tycker jag att det är Ja, jag tror jag har fått det i rätt ordning här somehow. Things look like individual pictures, page 947. Picture frames coming in and clouds moving. Instead of looking smooth, they look like little tangent lines in a spiral. Everything was discreet and chunky. Take classical physics. Everything is discreet there. There is no wholeness. And we learn from fractality, there is no discreteness. Everything can become more and more fractal. The Norwegian coastline doesn't have a discreteness to it. It has an infinity that is enormous. Most people today see space like this, like tangent and free dimensional cubes extending, not like spirals. And they seem, they feel like they are visages in a, in a cube-like space, like this room here. So they move about, go in different tangents. And there are these three orthogonal perpendicular lines, X, Y, Z, where you can <laughs> sort of move about in. And you have a starting point, T1, and you have a terminating point T2, and there in between you move. Now we know that is actually right hemisphere uh, deficiency, the lack of wholeness. Yeah, I think that's my comments. Kalle, please come in here. Do we need to take the microphone or something? We can do this, okay. So here in this paper, we see many traits typical of academia today. Oh, yes. Yeah. One is on 935, it's a, uh, it defines all this, of, uh, um, namely the persistent preoccupation parts of objects. Mm. Persistent preoccupation parts of objects. Typical of all this, that is typical universities today. And then 946. 946. 946. <laughs> Let's see. What do we have? About self-referentiality. Let me see. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, second paragraph. And the last phrase on the second paragraph. This does not mean that then that he has found a sudden genius of sudden genius for math. No. But rather developed an unusually perfectionistic attraction to creating diagrams that are self-referring and entirely composed of straight lines. <laughs> the self referring <laughs> is interesting because many Philosophers can say this is truth by itself. Yeah, yeah. So self referring statements mm -hmm. like this, they are not also have any connection with the real world. They are truisms or tautologies. And uh, let me go to 947, 947, next page. Seven, okay. okay. Next, next page, 47. Flow, let me see, we have a phrase, flow and smoothness, ah, it's last one sentence of that phrase, flow, flow and smoothness in time have become disrupted. Yeah. Mm. So that motion becomes. Yes, that has gone away. And indefinite numbers of individual frames initially tending towards stasis, fragmented and slowed off. And then uh, 948. Yes, 
Now for this curve lines have become reduced to an infinite number of rectilinear lines. Uh, so in my own field, Bible scholarship, editors of Biblia texts, uh, they prefer not parentheses. They don't like parentheses, uh, which are actually curved lines, really. Mm -hmm. I I would pro uh, I try to promote curved lines and oh, parentheses no. because uh, they represent the right hemisphere thinking. Editor editors today they prefer always these square brackets. Mm -hmm. From the very 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 sensitive. Yeah yeah yeah. Using these brackets. Indeed. <laughs> 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 So let me see. Yeah. And we had also a phrase about um trying to get the circle. Let me see. Ah. So Jason has this problem that he cannot draw a perfect circle. Um I want to add that perhaps in this case this is actually a positive thing. Uh, paradoxically enough. Because perfect circle is self-referring, mm -hmm. sign of the devil. Mm. Mm. So this is per perhaps a healthy thing. Yeah. Um, although the ideal should be the spiral mm. and not the circle itself. No, uh, indeed. So he, I think he is tries to see the circle as the perfect Idea, no idea, and and then perhaps nothing cannot be produced. No, 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 because he's so obsessed with straight lines. And uh, we could uh, uh, big, uh, end with Nicolas of Pisa. Mm. That's said, a great guy. Yeah, definitely. So he said that truth is not a thing like other things, or to differ from other things, but indivisible. Indivisible, yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, the only way of taking meaning out of something is by dividing it. There's no other possibility. And this is what these Bible scholars do. They take away the meaning from the Bible. So it becomes nonsensical with no wholeness. And the guys seem to have the same problem of making a circle. Well, very good. Thank you very much, Kali Lundo. Thank you. Thank you. And we end with Ian McIlchrist himself, the great Scotman's. And have a very beautiful day, afternoon or evening. Bye bye for now.